so I've been a, a financial professional for about 25 years. I started off in college originally as a pre-med. And so I've kind of bridged this gap between science and business for my whole career. I've got uh, degrees in uh, a master's degree, MBA in accounting and finance, as well as a master's degree in biology and, and uh, neurogenetics. And so throughout my career, I've been working primarily in the finance industry, but kind of, you know, helping scientists understand business and take their, their inventions and turning them into real businesses. And also working with uh, investors and business folks that don't necessarily understand the, the details of the science, uh, which is where, you know, the change really happens as a practical matter. So I've got a, an MBA, a CPA. I was an investment banker right out of college. And then I've been a pr principal buying and building businesses for the last uh, almost 20 years now. And if you were to sum up you being the founder of Verivest Capital, if you, can you just go ahead and just a quick overview about that? Because again, I can't talk about anybody's company. Uh, yeah, sure. Happy to. So, um, you know, we, we're kind of a, a niche player in the uh, asset management space. We, uh, we, we like to do things that protect the downside risk and also allow us to kind of swing for the fences with higher growth opportunities. We do a lot of things that are applications of life sciences. So that includes healthcare, diagnostics, that includes climate tech. I think ecology is the ultimate life science. Um, and obviously we also get involved in real estate. Uh, that's a big, a big piece of the assets that are held by our companies and has to be the that we managed uh, properly. Um, we really focus on how can we add value. So, you know, we're not tag along investors, um, you know, just allocating funds. We're actually hands on looking for ways that we can drive value in financial and non-financial ways. Let me share my screen here. Let me just figure out how to do that real quick. You got it, sir. And as Chris is switching over his screens, remember, there is going to be a Q&A right after this. So please have your questions ready to go. Even if you're for the first time listening to me speak about self-directed IRAs, I do see your screen at this point. But everybody will receive Chris's contact info, our contact info after this webinar. Give me one second and you're good to go, Chris. Okay, great. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And, you know, I just Thank appreciate uh, what you're doing because it is an educational process. Um, you know, the traditional stock and bond types of investments have been around for over a hundred years. There's a lot of marketing behind it, a lot of kind of process that people know about, um, but there are a lot of uh, trade-offs and, and risks and opportunities that people don't see in the private markets without the kind of education and the kind of platform you're bringing to allow them to access those kinds of investments. So that's kind of where we start. Uh, you know, we've been uh, investment managers for about 25 years, um, investing primarily in alternative assets. So that's private equity stocks, or private equity, uh, in some cases, venture capital, private real estate. Alternative assets includes things like timber, like oil and gas, natural resources, old masters, paintings, Ferraris. There's a whole asset class that's kind of emerging of things that aren't publicly traded stocks and bonds. And these tra tra traditionally have much better returns. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about old masters paintings. I don't know anything about that. But in terms of private companies that you can buy and build, typically have much better returns in the stock market over time uh, for a lot of reasons. You know, the kind of middle market private companies typically have a better valuation. You know, for public companies, maybe you're paying 20 or 25 times cash flow for those earnings. Uh, for private companies, it's probably more like, you know, five to seven to maybe 10 times. They also have better growth prospects typically. You know, when we buy a, buy a business, we're looking to double or triple the, the operating cash flow over three, four or five years. And we do that through kind of internal blocking and tackling and tuck in acquisitions versus public companies that kind of tend to grow overall, tend to grow at the rate of the, uh, the overall economy over time. And I'll get into some of those details a little bit later. Um, if you look at the, the best performing um, endowments or companies over time, typically they allocate about 30% of their whole portfolio to alternative assets. So, um, you know, if you look like the Yale endowment, that's kind of the, the, the benchmark for a diversified portfolio that outperforms, you know, the, the kind of the tracking indices that people use to compare them to. Uh, and that's big, again, you know, because alternative assets just, uh, have much better returns over time typically, but they also have things that are less attractive than publicly traded stocks. So I'm gonna uh, take you through a brief presentation here and try to educate you about the opportunities that we see um, in this kind of hybrid fund structure that we've created 
and kind of the, um, the structured financial products uh, historically on which the, the structure is based. Structured financial products uh, have a long history that you know they, they go back you know hundreds of years as well. And that's where, where people lay off different types of risks for different uh, participation in the upside. So it's used, structured financial products are used really broadly here in the States between institutions. You know, for example, if Prudential Insurance wants to have, you know, a chunk of the upside from the stock market, but have no downside, they'll go to a big institution like Goldman, they'll do a, a couple of billion dollar uh, synthetic instrument um, that lets them keep maybe 60% of the upside and no downside. Um, as an individual investor, you don't have that luxury typically, you know, there's just no instrument that, that lets you do the things that, that big companies can do. Um, it's different in Europe and Asia. In Europe and Asia, structured financial products are very popular and they're used for everything from you know, private company investments to real estate, to project financing and, and things like that. It's a, it's a couple of trillion dollar industry, about a $4 trillion industry in Asia, about a $2 trillion industry in Europe, and it's about 700 billion here in the States, mostly institutional, like I said. So, so part of what we saw is an opportunity to bring these, bring these uh, really advantageous types of investments to retail investors. And we kind of call it democratizing access because we think that, that people are, are really radically underinvested in alternative assets, but need to do it in a way that, that's safe and um, is superior on a risk adjusted basis. You know, typically with alternative assets, you invest in something, a single investment, and you either get a grand slam home run or maybe you get a goose egg. And I think anybody who's invested in a software startup or their neighbor's brilliant business plan that, that didn't pan out the way that they had hoped has enough experience to be gun shy. Um, so you know what, what the pros do is they diversify broadly. They'll invest in 40 or 50 or more individual investments and hopefully the winners offset the losers and you get good average returns. As an individual, that's a lot of work and that's really not you know, that's a full-time job for somebody. And that's not really probably the best way to, to spend your time or um, get the learning curve. It takes, you know, years and years to know how to manage those kinds of types of companies. So what we've done is, is we've created a structure that uses the best of the private equity world and the best of the hedge fund world and lets you kind of um, have superior returns on a risk-adjusted basis. So the private equity types of investments, and, and I'm sure you've seen these on Investors Row, typically have a pretty long-term lockup. That's because it, it takes time for the investment to really create value and create liquidity for, for shareholders. And then at some point, the fund gets liquidated, funds get distributed, and then the fund manager starts all over again with a new fund. So you know, pretty good long-term returns typically, but with uh, a long-term lockup and um, really no access to your, your capital except for you know, under some distress situations. The hedge funds typically offer minute to minute liquidity, um, but they don't offer the, the same kinds of returns that, that the private equity types of investments do. So we've tried to create this structure that you have the best of both worlds with the opportunity for liquidity, the opportunity for the kinds of returns you get from, from alternative assets and private equity, and your downside is, is secured. Let me just jump to the next slide here. So you know, how, how does that work in process as, as a practical matter? So what we do is, is we have two different portfolios within the, the fund. One portfolio is just designed to return the face amount of your principal at the end of you know, about five years. So those, those are invested in non-correlated assets, things like uh, investment grade debt, things like life settlements, um, you know, things that, that offer some measure of liquidity as well, like treasury strips and zero coupon bonds and, and things that um, you know, we can, we can um, be reasonably confident that the, the face amount of the investment will be returned and have some measure of liquidity along the way if in case someone needs to access that money sooner. And then the upside potential comes from alternative assets, growth equity investments, private equity company buyouts, um, real estate. You know, it comes from those traditional assets that we think if you manage those actively and manage them properly, really have an incredible long-term track record and you know, in the stock market, the new normal is maybe seven percent returns. In private equity, you know, we're looking at you know mid-teens to, to mid-20s with upside is kind of our, our benchmark for what we try to try to underwrite to when we, when we make an investment. The other other thing that we like about alternative assets in general is there are multiple ways to create value. So uh, you know, in the traditional you know, stock investment. 
you're really just relying on the, the internal growth of the, the company's earnings over time to create a return. Uh, and that, you know, that's, that's all well and good, but you're really, you know, private, public companies tend to be large companies, uh, highly correlated with the macro environment and have few opportunities to really create returns that are better than their average and their average is pretty low. So with private investments, we can do a lot of things that um, adds value in financial and non-financial ways. And again, you know, we do that while managing liquidity and providing downside protection. So, you know, some of those ways, and, you know, this is just a, a smattering of the strategies, but uh, some of those ways are, um, you know, really driving growth of a business through, through relationships, strategic relationships, through uh, kinds of channel partners that allow you to grow exponentially versus in a, a linear fashion um, by having access to opportunities that, that, you know, we're in the business all day, every day, looking for companies to acquire and companies to invest in. That's really a full-time job for myself and our business development team. And so we see, you know, we see deals every single day. I mean, I might see a hundred deals a week and then we can pick and choose the very best ones that we think offer this blend of downside protection and upside potential. Um, the other thing is we can drive growth through acquisitions. So a lot of companies, and if you look at the best performing private equity investments, they typically do a pretty significant acquisition within the first couple of years of their hold period in the portfolio. And then that creates synergies where they can take and uh, reduce cost and grow faster. Um, much harder to do as a big company. And you, you see big companies doing it all the time, but it's, it's pretty rare. They might do a big acquisition every decade. Whereas, you know, we can do a meaningful uh, strategic acquisition you know, or a small tuck-in, you know, uh, every year potentially. And then, um, you know, a lot of the things that we do to create value are really strategic in nature. So, you know, a, a big public company is really driving earnings and then earnings are multiplied by some kind of uh, price earnings ratio or, you know, price to growth analysis. And then that creates uh, an increase in stock price. What we can do as a, as a middle market private company owner is we can actually find ways that a company is more valuable to one of those big strategic buyers than it is just based on its revenues and earnings. And so one of our, our colleagues um, just takes companies that he knows, one of the, the big tech companies in the Bay Area are gonna wanna buy in a few years. And then we go in and we source the technology, the team, the channel partners, and kind of get that company to a, an inflection point where then it's worth a lot more to someone else than it is just a, on a pure revenues and earnings basis. So, um, you know, I can talk a lot about all the different aspects of the, the alternative asset and private equity strategies. I can talk a lot about the different aspects of, um, you know, securing the principal and providing downside protection. But I think what I'd like to, and I'm happy to answer those questions if, if that's of interest to you. I think what I'd like to do is really um, talk a little bit more about kind of the trends that we see and, um, you know, the, the applications that we think are really important in this environment. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that our strategy really is to apply applications of life sciences to business opportunities. And so that includes medical devices, diagnostics, therapeutics. It includes uh, the, kind of the, the climate tech investing, broadly defined. And uh, it includes kind of mission-based investors. So, you know, let's say someone you know, has a passion for wanting to cure cancer. And I think everyone has been touched by cancer, at least everyone of a certain age. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty intractable issue. Well, we can, we can structure an investment around having that, that kind of social mission. You know, let's go out and let's try and find a really interesting technology that's proven in, in the clinic to be efficacious against uh, cancer. But let's do it in a way that we don't lose our money. So you know, worst case scenario, we get our money back. Best case scenario, we cure cancer and we get an unbelievable kind of financial return. And we really structure a lot of our investments like that, where, where the incredible upside is, is balanced off with the ability to secure our, our downside. And then there's also something that's, that's non-financial, that's kind of that X factor, which that ultimately translate to, translates to financial returns as well. But I, we think in this environment, uh, it's all, a lot about sustainability. So it's how can we keep building, building a track to run on and how can we keep making a difference in the world and have that capital be 
uh, recycling in a way that creates returns for investors and also allows us to keep, keep sustaining that mission over time. And I think, you know, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's really an opportunity that most investors don't have access to. There are very few he uh, hedge private equity hybrid funds right now. We're seeing kind of a merger in the industry where, you know, traditional uh, hedge funds are investing in private equity, like on a pre-IPO basis. We're seeing things where venture capital funds are moving from a closed end to an open-ended structure, almost like a hedge fund. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of evolution in the industry, but right now it's, it's still early days. And uh, we think that we, we have, a, based on our experience, we have a, a mousetrap that's better than the alternatives for many types of situations, many types of investors. Um, and, you know, we're really excited about bringing that to, to individual investors, uh, retirement investors, um, to, you know, families and things like that, that want to diversify their portfolio and that want to do well and do good at the same time. Uh, kind of getting back to kind of some of the trade-offs between um, the, the kind of the hybrid structure or pure, pure investment, either in an index fund, a stock, or a different type of, of fund. You know, we, we think that the hybrid structure allows us to have uh, better returns on average and much less volatility. And, um, you know, we've benchmarked pretty much all the different types of alternative assets that are out there, the different classes and the different funds. And by having the, the downside protection for the principal security portfolio, it reduces the volatility of the returns dramatically. Uh, and then you're, you know, we're trading off some of those costs with the additional upside from these high growth types of situations. And overall, we see on a, on a risk adjusted basis, incredible benefits to combining the, the two asset classes um, where you have both superior returns, um, better than average returns for, for um, a peer group. And you have, again, you have the ability to kind of have the downside secured. Uh, you know, Vermes said that the, the stock market is down 20% year to date. You know, it's not, it's not unusual for a, you know, peak to trough market correction to be 35 or 40%. We've seen that over and over again since the 1920s. Um, you know, and, and depending on when you want to invest or when, when you want to retire, um, getting access to those funds, those depressed levels is, is really, really damaging. And even, you know, Forbes did a, a research piece about a year ago. And they found that about 85% of all the returns over any one, five or 10 year period came from about 15% of the stocks. So even being in the wrong stocks at the wrong, wrong time can just crush your ability to retire when you want to on with, with the income that you need. So a lot of this stuff, it sounds kind of academic and theoretical, but if you're looking to retire at a certain age and maintain a certain lifestyle, those kinds of issues have real impact for you. Our experience is that you make a lot of money in times of change, and we're seeing two really major mega trend issues that I think that investors can benefit from. Uh, the first is uh, energy sovereignty. You know, so when when places like the Ukraine, uh, you know, cause a, a global energy crisis because of the the war uh, that you know, the Russia initiated, you know, there's a big move to you know what I'm calling energy sovereignty, whereas you can put solar panels on your house, you can be a small business and put a wind turbine up. You can do an off-the-grid power source, um, so you don't have you know the rolling blackouts and brownouts like Texas and California have experienced recently, uh, and that requires a capital investment with really incredible long-term returns, both economic returns and also just self-determination security types of returns. Please make sure to pull out your phones, take a picture of this um, if you would like to speak to Chris um, after this presentation. It's a pleasure having you, sir. Thank you. Learned a lot myself about hybrid funds. Have a great day. The information contained herein is intended to help the viewer successfully navigate common IRS and Department of Labor requirements to help achieve successful results from their IRA. The information is not intended to replace information from your legal counsel or income tax professional. IRA Club does not offer or sell any investment. All investments have risk.